Exactly, right on the coast. Okay, Ephesians chapter 3 um, and verse 14. Uh, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may be able, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Um, Sue Ann, would you pray, pretty please? Okay, so last week we talked a little about spiritual growth and in a variety of ways, and I thought it might be interesting for the second Wednesday to go on the flip side and talk about and just try to see what it is to, to see what the end of that road would be. The full measure of a super f- spirit-filled, mature Christian and what that looks like. Um, and I can't help but start uh, in uh, Ephesians 3 here in this threefold prayer that concludes with the idea that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And if he's saying that ye might be able, then, then it must be possible that you can actually be filled with all the fullness of God. And I remember after coming back to the Lord and uh, going through uh, Paul's letters with Stan, how, you know, that phrase just really struck me. And uh, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it ever since. And it's just an amazing thought to consider that toward the that that the height of spiritual growth is that you might be be filled with all the fullness of God. And uh, so this prayer is really interesting. Um, it's a threefold prayer. Um, of course, at the beginning of the chapter, we have those dispensational verses in which Paul talks about that special revelation committed to him. And so you know that really the fullness of God begins there, begin by understanding the distinction between you know prophecy and mystery in, in order to see the complete picture of God's eternal purpose for his son and how there is a distinction between what, how Jews play a role in that purpose and how, the, how those who have been saved in the dispensation of grace play a role in that eternal purpose. Um, and you get down to this threefold prayer. And the interesting thing about the prayer to me is that you have, every time he says the word that, he's punctuating a new point. And so there's three that's followed by a fourth of that, which... Uh, seems to be the conclusion of his prayer, the, the result. If you f- fulfill the three requirements in the, in the threefold prayer, then the conclusion and the result would be that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Um, and so you have in like verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That number two, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to uh, comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. In uh, verse 16, he says that he would grant you according to the riches. Oh, sorry. So, um, and I remember Stam saying in the radio program, after having come across the, that you might be filled with the fullness of God, he kept emphasizing that, you know, it's not God's will that our lives should feel empty and meaningless. God wants our lives to be full and rich, and this can only happen when we experience the love of Christ and respond to it. And even then, I, kept, I remember thinking, but even this fails to really express fully uh, what it means to be really be filled with the fullness of God. Is it really possible? 
Um, and yes, it's possible. So how, how full are we talking? Um, and really, it's as full as the love of Christ itself, which has no end. And I remember I had to, I read, um, I had to see what William Kelly had to say about it. My man, William Kelly, uh, he's on the zip drive. He's um, um, a uh, Irish grace believer from the late 1800s. And he wrote about grace more beautifully than anybody else. But when, he, when it came to the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, he said that Paul does not mean that we shall ever know it perfectly, but there may be the knowing more and more of that which surpasses knowledge. He supposes us launched upon that sea where there is no shore. We can never reach the end of his love. Yet he speaks of knowing the knowledge surpassing love of Christ, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You could no more get to the end of the love than you could get to the end of God himself. Nothing can be more wonderful than such a desire for us, feeble creatures as we are, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And yet it is for the saints now that the apostle thus prayed, not that we might know ourselves to be Christ's body, the fullness of him that that fills all in all, but the practically enlarged entrance by the power of the Spirit into God's fullness, It is the heart's condition and real growth in communion with God that is before us here. So you have with this prayer, um, this threefold prayer, he starts with the riches of his glory, and then he ends it with that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And there's a connection between the two, it seems. And so my first question was, you know, what is the riches of his glory exactly? What is the riches of his glory? And interesting, um, uh, the the Apostle Paul, I mean, we all, you've read a million times that Paul talks about grace more than anything else. Well, interestingly, he mentions glory more than anyone else too. Um, The word um, glory and glorious, um, I counted, were used 457 times throughout the scripture. And over a hundred of those times, Paul uses uh, those words. He talks about glory more than anybody else. He talks about glory more than all of the New Testament writers combined, um, which was interesting. Um, in, in Romans, he talked about how we you know, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, how that Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. At the end of Romans, he says, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. In 2 Corinthians, he says, but we all with open face Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit, by the Spirit of the Lord. We also know He's going to change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. Um, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Um, he also says, uh, unto Him... Be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. He also talked about the glorious liberty of the children of God. Of the gospel, he called it the glorious gospel of Christ and the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And when Paul talked about the rapture, he, um, it was a glorious event with the, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's, there's a lot of different aspects to the word glory, but you know, when you think about the glory of God, you usually think of, of light, you know, the great light and the great power that's, that's in that light. Um, it was the glory of the Lord that brought Paul to his knees in Damascus. Um, we know that the Lord is dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. But John had an, an interesting thought about that. Um, John 1.14. Um, John also talked about the glory of the Lord in a different light, no pun intended. Um, he said, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So I suspect, I mean, he could have been talking about things like the transfiguration, but at the same time to witness 
the character of Christ in person is to behold the very glory of God. Um, and so what Paul meant by the riches of his glory, Bruce, um, he had a, a lesson on uh, um, being filled with the fullness of God. And he had suggested that the riches of his glory, um, you can uh, get that, get a sense of that from um, Exodus 34. Exodus 34, 6. And I'm going to actually go back there and read that. Exodus 34 is when you had, um, when Moses told the Lord, show me your glory. And the Lord said, no man can see my face and live. And so he said, I'm going to put you in a special place. I'm going to cover your face with my hand so that you can't see my glory. And you'll only be able to see the, the backside of me. And so as he went by him in here in Ephes- uh, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it said when the Lord went by him, he actually proclaimed his glory. He said, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So he proclaimed his glory, which was his character. Well, he's talking about his relation with Israel. He, I, he, in here, he's talking about his relation with Israel, but I'm only focusing on his personality, which is timeless. Um, you know, the person, his, his merciful and gracious character, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Um, and, you know, so to say that to... So, Paul... Sometimes it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's. Um, Thank you. And our sin nature, sure. Um, so, um, I w- so Brisset was suggesting, according to the riches of his of his glory, that um, Paul was talking about the riches of his character, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his grace, the riches of his long suffering, the riches of his goodness, the riches of his truth, and the riches of his forgiveness, um, and everything, and his justice. Uh, everything is right and holy with God. So according to the riches of his glory, his character, we can be filled with all the fullness of him. Um, back in Ephesians uh, 3, in verse 19, you have the, uh, the fullness of, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The word fullness was another um, interesting um, word to study. Um, it's uh, used uh, in total uh, in, in Scripture 25 times. 25 times in the Old Testament, once in John, or I'm sorry, 12 times in the Old Testament, once in John, and 12 times in Paul's letters. Paul talked about fullness more than any other writer, too. And uh, um, George, uh, Psalms 24.1, I'm sure fullness doesn't really need to be defined for, those, <laughs> for the folks here, but here's one aspect of fullness. Um, Psalms 24.1. He says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So earth and all that there is in the earth belongs to him. Fullness speaks of all, to fill up, complete, 
as all that there is. So when you're talking about the fullness of God, you're talking about all that He is, that you might be filled with all the fullness of all that God is in His great character. In Psalm 1611, this is what, maybe we could go to that together. Psalm 1611, and I love this, this verse. Um, Psalm 1611, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So when it comes to joy, David means all, filled up, complete, all that there is. You can't get any more joy than that. It's the very limit of how much can be felt. And you contrast that with the, you know, you think about how wonderful it will be to be in the presence of the Lord versus, you know, the misery of an eternal separation uh, from God. And um, which is a scary thought. Now, John had um, an interesting uh, his the the one time he used fullness was interesting. um, And this is in John 116. He said that and this kind of is it goes along with the thought of the the verse in John 114 that we read. But he says, And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. I mean, through Christ they were offered all that was promised. They were given, offered the kingdom, a Messiah, new covenant, the Holy Spirit. But all that God was, the very fullness of His righteous character, existed in the person of His Son. And in the connection between these two verses, you had in John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, where... The incarnate word was said to be full of grace and truth. When the kingdom saints received him, they received the fullness of grace and truth in the person of his son. Um, Paul talks about fullness, uh, the, the fullness of the Israelites and the fullness of the Gentiles of the Israelites. I mean, we all know the verses. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness the Israelites would eventually fulfill God's plan for them. But until that time, uh, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And God has extended to the Gentiles the grace and love and salvation so that we may also be a part of the fullness of God and play a role in the eternal purpose in His Son. Look at um, Ephesians. Uh, how about we turn to Ephesians 4? Um, 4.13. Um, Ephesians 4.13 uh, was the goal of the, is, a, is the goal of the Christian life. And he talks about, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God wants to work on our life to build our character to the stature, to the measure of the fullness of Christ. Awesome. Um, Matthew Henry, um, talking about that phrase, he said, so as to be Christians of a full maturity and ripeness in all the graces derived from Christ's fullness, or according to the measure of that stature, which is to make up the fullness of Christ, which is also to fill up his spiritual body. Now we shall never come to the perfect man till we come to the perfect world. There is a fullness in Christ and a fullness to be derived from him, and a certain stature of that fullness and a measure of that stature are assigned in the counsel of God to every believer. And we never come to that measure till we come to heaven. And we also have in, in chapter 4 um, so many ways that we are taught how to grow up. That we henceforth be no more children. That we should speak the truth in love. That we should grow up into Christ in all things. In knowledge, love, faith, and all the parts of the new man. The more we grow into a closeness with Christ, faith in Him, love to Him, dependence upon Him, the more we shall flourish in every grace until we are a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Of the, okay, so um, how about we go to Ephesians 1? Um, Ephesians 1. 
there is on the uh, continuing the thought about fullness. He has up in verse eight, Ephesians one, eight through 10. Which was um, amazing passages, Ephesians 1, 8. He says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Paul talks about the fullness of times and how God was made, has made known unto us what is the mystery of His will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He's going to gather together in all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. The dispensation of the fullness of times, correct me if I'm wrong, means that time is complete, that it's the fullness of time, that time has run its course. And all that God has designed for time to accomplish will find its fulfillment in Christ being the head of heaven and earth. Does that sound good to you, Hal? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I have, I, um, um, the other part of this was, that I thought was interesting is verse 8, that God has made known us the mystery of his will. You wouldn't know God's complete big picture for heaven and earth without understanding the mystery of his will given to Paul because we know now that the Gentiles play a role in God's eternal purpose for His Son. Um, Not only has His will been made known to us, but also the wisdom and the prudence of His will. Um, Prudence being the skill, the excellent management, the good judgment, um, moral insight into the way that He is uh, carrying out His will, how wise God was, how strategic and brilliant He has been in the carrying out of His will, and in the way He is making Jesus Christ preeminent, over all things, both in heaven and in earth. Further in the chapter, you've got here in Ephesians 1, um, another threefold prayer, which is interesting and relates to um, what we were talking about down in verse 16, and everybody knows these verses, I'm sure. Um, Cease not to give thanks, you know, he's talking about how he ceased not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that, again, that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. So, Paul, you know, and I had heard that Ephesians isn't about how you got saved, but why. And how is it that we can have the spirit of wisdom, small s, spirit of wisdom, and the revelation in the knowledge of Him? Well, obviously, His book. The, 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 whole, uh, the whole Bible. And it's not just mystery, it's both prophecy and mystery, which are distinct and yet they go hand in hand, as Hal talked about uh, last Sunday. Together, they provide the complete picture of God's eternal purpose for His Son, and we're a part of that. Um, verse 18, "...the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what, it, what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints." And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So Paul is praying that we might be, you know, enlightened, that we might know those phrases, the hope of his calling, that we might know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, which is what we're going to inherit as saints, and that we might know the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe And he describes the greatness of his power with the example of his resurrection. And because the exceeding great power God used to accomplish the resurrection of Christ is specifically to uh, was done specifically to us who believe, the believer is exhorted to manifest that resurrection power in his life. We can aspire in our lives, as Paul wrote, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And it's one thing to be kept by the power of God through faith unto that glorious salvation at the coming of the Lord. And it is another thing to live by day by to live day by day in resurrection power. Uh, Verse 20, um, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power. And, uh, and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, 
and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So our salvation is part of what God wants to do to complete his purpose in Jesus Christ. We just thought we got out of hell, but uh, we become the, um, the purpose of what God wants to do to glorify his son. He's going to use us to fulfill that purpose. Jesus Christ became the head of the church, the body, which is, his, which is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And we're part of God's fullness. We're part of his plan for eternity future to glorify his son. Um, Colossians 1. Yes, please. Right. Do you think he's talking about our inheritance or Christ's inheritance? <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Getting a little, a little help. So he, had, he had absolutely none of those questions Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for a yes or no. To What is the rich, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Yep. Yeah, it would actually. Yeah, I can see that totally. Um, when I see inheritance in the saints, I just think woohoo! I get free stuff, you know, with the with the, all the other inheritance up there in the heavenly places. So, um, Colossians one, uh, pretty please. Uh, Colossians one twelve. And 13. Uh, he says, um, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us unto the kingdom of his dear Son. It's amazing he allowed the Gentiles to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, and he translated us from the power of darkness into the power of the kingdom of his dear son. We're taken out of Satan's dominion and put under Christ's dominion, a dominion that's part of the dispensation of the fullness of times. Um, in verse 14, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The image of the invisible God. He's God who became man so that we could identify with Jesus Christ. He was the first to be given a resurrected body. He was the first to be made the way God intended for the new heaven and the new earth. Yes? Does that sound good? That sounds good. That's one of, we've been talking, you and I, about the possible authorship of the book of Hebrews. Right. This passage is one of the passages. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Because of the way it begins, being the brightness of his glory and the express image mm -hmm. of his person. Right. Right. Well, thank you for that. You just gave me an argument. It, did I hear that right? You just gave me a reason to say well, Paul wrote Hebrews? I, I, I'll give you all the arguments. You <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Oh, no. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm going to stick with simple subjects for a few years, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, verse 16. Uh, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is by him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, um, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So it pleased the God, pleased God the Father that all the fullness of heaven and earth dwells in His Son. And to make his son complete, and I don't really hate saying that, to make him full, uh, to, make, uh, to bring the fullness of his son about, he became the head of the church, the body of Christ, and we became 
part of the means by which God is going to fill heaven and earth with the glory of His Son. We're going to become part of the fullness of God. We already are, actually. Um, Not only do we know who we are, what we have in Christ, but we also know uh, what that uh, we also know that we'll become a part of God's eternal purpose in glorifying His Son. You know, we thought we just escaped hell, but we became part of something so much greater than just escaping hell, part of God's eternal purpose in glorifying His Son. That's just amazing to me. I'm just studying that. I'm just like, wow. Um, um, Colossians 2, real quickly. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. We all know these verses well, too, I'm sure. Uh, 9 and 10. Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So all the fullness of God exists bodily, uh, is bodily present in the person of Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh, the Godhead being also the governing power over everything. And in verse 10, you have, in, you have this really, I mean, we all know this phrase, and you are complete in him, but he marries this phrase with the fact that he is the head of all principality and power. Do you ever wonder why he did that? Why you have those two phrases married together in one verse? <laughs> I'm trying to find my place. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just throw a thought out there, um, and I'm curious to know what you might think. But, you know, for one thing, you could talk about the body. Um, he would not be much of a head of the body of Christ if we were not complete. If you had saints who were not eternally secure, and they were constantly going in and out of the body, right? Um, losing their salvation, restoring their salvation, and all of that. He wouldn't be a, much of a head, and it wouldn't be much of a body, and it wouldn't be much... Uh, power in that position if the body was so weak that nobody had eternal security. Right. Right, right, right. Did you have a thought, Hal? What do you think about that? Did you like that thought? Yeah. Yeah, keep on working, preaching material. Um. But there's more to it than that. We're part of God's eternal purpose for His Son. God's purpose for the body of Christ is to take us from earth and to seat us unto heavenly places under the headship of Jesus Christ for God's glory. God already had a purpose for the nation of Israel. He was going to set them apart as a a kingdom of priests, and He was going to give them a kingdom and a king to sit on David's throne and all of that. But the fullness of God doesn't simply involve the earth. The fullness of God... And his plan for his son involves the heavens and making Jesus Christ preeminent in the heavens as well. And so God turned to us Gentiles by his grace and saved us by his grace and placed us in the church, the body of Christ. And we became the means by which Jesus Christ is going to be head of all principalities and powers in the heavens and in the earth. We complete God's purpose for his son. Okay, Hal's nodding. I'm going to continue. Um, And this is why he could, in verse 15, talk about having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In it, I think, being the cross. He not only saved us via the cross, but he robbed Satan and his angelic host of their authority and of their place in heaven and stripped them of any glory they might have had because God saved us and made us the fullness of Christ. So then you get back to Ephesians 3, um, which... Ephesians 3.16. And he, you, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, the riches of his character, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You can't be filled with all the fullness of God without understanding and appreciating all He's done to us, for us, and making us a part of His eternal purpose for His Son. And it would be something that would consume you. That, you know, to 
to be completely filled with Him would be for us to be completely consumed by Him. Um, everything centers around God and the purpose for His Son and the glory of His Son. When we understand that, we can be consumed with all that God is, all that He has done, and be grateful for everything, and we can be filled with all the fullness of God. And people who would not recognize the mystery would have no idea what the fullness of God really is. In Colossians 1.25, Paul said it was given to him to fulfill the word of God. I have no idea why I just wrote that. Um, it's a good word. <laughs> By the same token, reading that verse, when it talks about that you might, that you might be filled right. with all the fullness of God. Right. Seems to imply that you can be a believer and not be right. filled Right, exactly. With all Exactly. And here, so it says it's to know the love of Christ. Right. Which passes knowledge. Right. So then you can all say well, if you don't know the love of Christ. Right. You cannot be filled. You cannot be filled. Right. You might be, be be able to go so far as to include the other two points too, that you you know that if you were to fulfill these three that's that you could be you might be filled. So that you that he would grant you a quote, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, that you be re- uh, rooted and grounded in love, and to comprehend that which passeth knowledge, which is interesting. You, you, you could comprehend something that passes knowledge. It's, it's, it's possible, but seems like it's unlikely. I remember, and I can't remember what commentary it was. Uh, somebody was talking about with a fee, uh, that here... Uh, he made a distinction between human knowledge and spiritual knowledge that, you know, human knowledge has its limits, but you can actually, with spiritual knowledge, understand things that would pass the normal carnal human knowledge that um, is out there. Um, So anyway, I thought that was interesting. Um, If you compare, now if you compare the Ephesians 1 prayer and the Ephesians 3 prayer, you'll see in Ephesians 1, it's all about being enlightened and that you might know these things. But then in Ephesians 3, you know, it's all about your heart, that you might know things that are past understanding, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Not that you just know these things, but that these things go inside your heart and they consume your life where you realize what life is all about, and that, you're, that you're being a part of God's eternal purpose for His Son. Um, and you may be filled with the, you might be filled with the fullness of God. That sums up the full measure of the Christian life. You, might, you may be filled with the fullness of Him. You can know Him so deeply that you, you've become Christ-like in your walk. You can have a sound mind. You can be filled in abundance with all the fruits of the Spirit. You can be persecuted for His name's sake. You can endure all suffering with joy while also praising Him for those sufferings. You can be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. And we can say, as Paul said in Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And there was a sentence I loved when I did the message on power uh, during the conference. Um, It's God's desire that we should be filled with all the fullness of Him to a degree that's exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the exceeding riches of His grace, carried out by the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe in perfect harmony with the counsel of His own will. And that is all I have. And he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Yeah, and I don't know if you were, I don't think you were here, but there, is, there are actually three exceedings in Ephesians, and they're all related. And actually, I brought them all together in this, in this one sentence. But, you know, you have the, the exceeding riches of his grace, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, and that you can be filled with a fullness to a degree that's exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Fascinating. Yeah, very good. I've often thought about that phrase, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Right. And I would suggest the ultimate question that escapes most people is what we find in the content of Romans chapter 5. Mm-hmm. And that while we were yet sinners, mm-hmm. Christ died for us. And, and the ultimate question is, how could 
God died for the likes of us. Mm-hmm. And the only way that you'll ever come close to comprehension of that is the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Right, right, exactly. Aided but by the Holy Spirit, Spirit a little bit. Right, right. Really, would, it would take the Word of God plus a little help from the Spirit, perhaps. Um, I just, I never could get over, I still can't get over, and I don't feel like I even came close to addressing, I mean, what it means to be filled with, a, that's just an amazing thought. Well, that's because we're trying to understand it with our finite mind. <laughs> and uh, we can't. Right. But we do have the mind of Christ. Right. So we can get it. Right. But then we, uh, it, 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 it uh, slides back out after a few minutes. <laughs> 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 but the question is, oftentimes, you know, we, we talk about this, and even in, we're in the book of Philippians, uh, on, a, on a, a Wednesday uh, afternoon at noon, and the thing is, you know, you get to see what the Apostle Paul says, you know, not that I had a thing. Right, a right, exactly. And what right. he was talking about was victory. He was talking about uh, victory over sin and the flesh. And so we say, well, is it possible? And we always want to come to the same conclusion. Well, it's possible, but how probable is it? Right. Well, who's asking that question? Well, one of the first things you have to learn when you're when you're sa- when you first get saved, you go through Romans, really, the foundational book, and, and you reckon yourself to be dead to sin. It's one of the f- first basic principles, and yet, you know, <laughs> for the rest of your life, you're going to struggle so long as you are inside the flesh, right? Right. And you have a question, what is the fullness of his glory? Right. And and several passages come up. Hebrews one comes to me. He says he's the, the brightness of his glory, he's the brightness of God's glory, mm-hmm. and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. God the Father has Christ uphold all things by the word of his power. Mm-hmm. And it sat down at the right hand of the majesty on 1 Corinthians 15 talks about mm-hmm. how when everything is delivered unto the Son, mm-hmm. He too becomes subject unto the Father. But mm-hmm. you do a study on that, that thing on glory, mm-hmm. and you go back and, and you look, you said it's, always, it's associated with light. It's almost always associated with light. Mm-hmm. And you look at the, you know, you mentioned the, the one, you know, he, he helped, hit him in the, in the right. crevice. Um, were you, yeah, I was going to ask you if you were okay with that. What did you think of it? Well, absolutely, but the, the, other, the other area, it's also always associated with the ark mm-hmm. and the Holy of Holies. Mm-hmm. And, and when the, the Philistines stole the ark, and, and eventually so many people died, they sent it back. Mm-hmm. When they opened the ark, <laughs> 25,000, because of the glory of God associated with that, 25,000. <laughs> and when you think about that stuff, mm-hmm. that's the same glory that Paul said mm-hmm. is resident in us. That's that's scary. That is scary. <laughs> and once again, somewhat beyond comprehension. Yes. What I like about these things is uh, so many times we focus on the negative side or focus on the limitations of who we are. And really, I think Paul would want us to think of, of these in light of the possibility. Mm-hmm. And we could do that. And, uh, and Philippians 4 talks about to be honest and pure and just right. and things. He says, think on these things. Right. So if we can put it in the realm of the possibility, right. and when, think on these things, right. we have confidence. I, when I struggled, when I was extremely sensitive with sin after coming back to the Lord, I was constantly apologizing for my mistakes. You know, and Dave kept pounding into me, Philippians 3.13, you know, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forth unto the things that are before. You just forget and you stay focused on him and reaching forth unto the things that are before. So what, is, so what are the things to reach for? You know, being filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Um, I mean, uh, what, more, what more can you... <laughs> I mean, what, 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 what? certainly replace, it's replacement thinking. Right. Yeah, pressing, pressing toward the mark kind of thinking, right. But it's hard to, 
just make a mistake and then try to forget about it and not beat yourself up over it. But I mean, Dave would tell me that we Saturday after Saturday after Saturday after Saturday over men's breakfast until I, until I finally like, do you know any other verses, Dave? I don't. But I, he knew that was the one I needed the most. You know, he's like, once you understand this, we'll, I'll take you to something else. Um, okay, is that anything else?